Happy Wednesday! You're listening to Mama Murdered a Podcast. I'm your host, A.B. This week on Mama Murdered a Podcast, we'll be covering the case of Jessica Chambers. She was a beautiful 19-year-old former cheerleader from a small town in nowhere, Mississippi, with her entire life ahead of her. That was until December in 2014 when volunteer firefighters responded to a call about a car being on fire. But when they arrived at the scene, Jessica would be found walking towards them and she had been burned alive. That wouldn't stop her, though, from trying to relay to first responders who had did this to her. This is going to be a really hard case to listen to. It was really hard to research, so it's probably going to be an extremely hard episode for two different reasons. One, for the simple fact that this is an exceptionally gruesome and heinous murder, and secondly, because the one man that has been put through two jury trials already, both of those trials came with no end result, really. So you've been warned, and we're all here for one thing and one thing only. Let's get it. On December 6, 2014, a 911 call came in at 812 concerning a car being on fire in Cortland, Mississippi. First responders were actually able to get to this car fire within a matter of minutes because they had actually just left from a small house fire or a house that had called in about some smoke being inside. When they arrived on the scene, they could see that the car was kind of sitting on a higher ground on an embankment but there didn't seem to be anybody inside the car that they could see. And the first responders actually said that their first thought was that this was probably an insurance fraud fire. But nobody knew if this car had been in an accident, and if so, did the accident cause the car to catch fire? Or could there be another reason why this car sitting on the side of a rural rural road, that's hard to say, and it's, it's literally engulfed in flames? And from what they could see and tell, it seemed to be a 2005 Kia Rio that was mainly blazing up on the passenger side of the car. And about 30 or 40 feet away from where they were all standing, a figure was walking towards them out of the woods. Two out of the almost dozen people who were asked to recall what they saw during this exact time said that the figure walking towards them looked like a zombie. One guy even said that it looked like something you would see on The Walking Dead show. And both men that said this said that they realized how harsh that sounds as a way to describe somebody, but that was the only accurate description they could give in order for them to get across how bad the scene that they had driven up on actually was. And it wasn't until this figure got much closer to them that they realized that this wasn't just a silhouette of a figure coming towards them. This was a woman who had been so severely burned that she was completely unrecognizable. All of the first responders reported that this woman was completely naked except for her underwear, and that her underwear had kind of been melted into her skin by the flames. They also said that once they got a closer look, that this unidentified woman had been burned so severely that there were actually pieces of her flesh and skin hanging off of her charred body. Some first responders would even later testify that they didn't know how she was even able to be alive and walking towards them, just based on her burn injuries alone. But then this unidentified woman would speak and shook the entire town of Cortland, Mississippi, from then until this very day. One of the first responders was Seth Cook, and he describes this woman as being dazed in a trance and having trouble walking. And after first responders jumped into action and tried to help in any way that they could until the helicopter was able to come and get this woman further treatment, They were able to cover her body up in a blanket because a lot of them reported that they had learned that burn victims are oftentimes cold and that they had started trying to see if they could get any kind of information or answers out of her as far as maybe what her name was and if she was able to give them any kind of clues or, you know, information as to what had happened to her car because at this point, they don't know. And even though their initial thoughts were either an accident caused the fire or maybe this was insurance fraud on a vehicle, After more of the facts surrounding this investigation came about, it became undeniably clear that this was an attempted murder. And District Attorney John Champion is even quoted after the investigation progressed some as saying, quote, absolutely not. There's no way this was an accident. Paramedic Joshua Perkins asked this woman if she could tell him her name, and Perkins said that even though her voice was really low and grabbled, that he could clearly understand her when she said that her name was Jessica. And Joshua Perkins wouldn't be the only first responder to ask Jessica questions. There were multiple first responders who later gave their statements to police, and they all agreed that once she was able to get out those few words that she could, that it was pretty clear that her name was in fact Jessica. 
Another first responder asked her what her last name was, and they claimed that it sounded like she said Jessica Tambers. And luckily, one of the first responders were able to put together the type of car and the name Jessica Tambers, and slowly started to realize that this was actually Jessica Chambers, who lived in Cortland, Mississippi, and she was a 19-year-old cheerleader. And even between all the chaos of a car that's literally still on fire and a woman who had actually been set on fire... And also a half dozen or so first responders on scene. At least two of those first responders still noticed a man that seemed to be walking around the road where the car and Jessica were found, and he seemed pretty suspicious. Both of these first responders would later testify that this man was asked several times to back away from the crime scene, and they described him as a middle-aged black man wearing a blue shirt. And at least one of these two first responders said that this man never spoke a word, and he seemed to be staring straight through him and solely focused on the fire and Jessica and into the woods as he asked him to back away from the crime scene. This same first responder that testified that this man was seemed to be solely focused on the car and Jessica also said that this was a stare that he has never seen before, and that by the time first responders noticed the man walking away that he had a white shirt on, and not a blue one like they had just seen him in only minutes before this. And it seems like this suspicious man got into a vehicle when he finally did leave the scene, and one of the first responders was able to get a tag number from his car that he rode off in. Let's go ahead and get mad about this man now, because he never comes up again. He was never found, he was never questioned. Did he even exist? I'm not sure. But the name Jessica wasn't all that they were able to get out of her, though. Multiple first responders asked Jessica what happened, and they were stunned when Jessica tried to relay the message that, quote, Eric tried to kill her, or that, quote, Eric had set her on fire. But between the soot and the smoke inhalation, a few of the first responders weren't actually sure if she had said Eric or Derek. But either way, it was a start. And even though she had started to try to explain who had done this to her, that Eric sounded more like Herrick and... It could have been Eric, Derek, or neither of those two names. The car had been burned so badly that the paint on the car was completely melted away. The car was originally black, and it almost looked like a white ash color when they were able to get the fire put out. And it would be around 8.30 p.m. on December 6, 2014, when Jessica's parents would get a call that they could have never prepared themselves for. They were told that Jessica had been set on fire, that she was alive but in critical condition with burns, char, ash, and soot covering up to 95% of her only 104-pound body. Her body was covered in first, second, and third-degree burns literally on 95% of her body. Her entire body had been set ablaze, but why, though? That was the question that everybody wanted answered. Jessica was met at the hospital by both of her parents, and sadly, Jessica would only live for another few hours before she succumbed to her burn injuries. After further inspection of Jessica, they slowly started to realize why her body had been burned so badly, but they had no idea as to the question of who had burned her this badly. Jessica's mom, Lisa, was actually with her at the hospital up until the very end, And Jessica's mom says that she actually had to tell Jessica that it was okay to let go. That after the rest of her family visited with her, that she didn't have to hold on any longer. That if it was her time, she could just go. Shortly after her mom told her this, Jessica did pass away with her mom, Lisa, holding her hand. She sat right by her side, and at 2.37 a.m. on December 7, 2014, Jessica Chambers was declared dead. This was almost six hours exactly since the call had come in about the car fire initially. And Jessica tried to hold on long enough to catch her own murderer. And the last thing that Jessica's mom, Lisa, ever said to her daughter was that she would get justice for her. So now let's talk about why Jessica was actually burned so badly. During the autopsy that was performed on Jessica after she passed away, it was found that whoever had done this to her had actually poured gasoline or some kind of flammable accelerant down Jessica's throat and into her nasal cavities. And they also covered her entire body, which would explain why her burns were so severe. So this gasoline or flammable liquid was poured down her throat and nose and all over her body and her car. That would mean that Jessica was not only being burnt from the outside of her body, that she was actually burning internally and in excruciating pain. They also found uh, traces of marijuana in Jessica's toxicology report, Which does not come as a surprise to me. She's 19 and lived in nowhere, Mississippi. 
That's normally what teenagers do. Her cause of death would be listed as thermal injury burns, which I had never even heard of in a case like this before, so I had to look it up. And thermal injury burns are described as thermal burns that result from external heat sources, such as flames, hot liquid, heated solid objects, or hot gases. And also that fire-related deaths may also result from inhalation of carbon monoxide or other toxic products of combustion, including cyanide. So let me dumb that down, because I'm sure there's more people than just me going, huh, to themselves right now. That just means that somebody had to have done this to Jessica, that it's very, very likely she did not do this to herself. Expert witness and medical director Dr. William Hickerson would later testify that the burns covering Jessica's body would have made her skin almost like leather-like. Even going so far as to say that the zombie description, that the way some of the first responders recall Jessica looking, were pretty accurate to what her skin and body would have looked like. Since her skin would have been like a leather from the burns, she wouldn't have been able to move her hands and arms as freely as she normally would. Dr. William Hickerson also goes on to explain that first-degree burns are something similar to sunburn, that most people get it at least once in their life. Maybe you grabbed a curling iron or touched the stove. But a third-degree burn goes all the way through your skin with no chance of regeneration to the top layer of the skin, and it would leave almost no chance of survival in a case where more than 95% of a body was burned. The forensic pathologist would later say that thermal heat exposure, along with the smoke and soot inhalation, were also contributing factors to Jessica's death. Y'all work with me. I don't know why words are so hard for me today, but Jessica's vocal cords were actually burned and her tongue was singed, which will come back kind of later and backfire on the prosecution during the trial. Some of the expert witnesses testified that Jessica wouldn't have even been able to speak at all. So if that was the case, then the Eric or Derek that they had been so heavily relying on throughout this case would actually kind of later hurt the investigation more than it helped. And as I lay out the trial that goes on in this case, or actually two trials later in part two, maybe three, there will end up being at least eight different first responders or emergency personnel who testified that Jessica clearly told them one of two things, that either Eric set me on fire or Eric did this to me. So... This is one of the key factors, you know, the name Eric or Derek would end up being like a make it or break it kind of factor in determining the this case as far as trial goes. Because Dr. William Hickerson will testify again that Jessica probably was trying to speak and that something was coming out, I'm sure, but that her enunciation and verbiage would be extremely unlike the way she would normally speak, making it even harder to understand what she's saying between no enunciation and verbiage and, you know, the smoke and soot inhalation that, along with the fact that her vocal cords were burned. I mean, she may have been trying to say a number of different things. And Jessica's older sister, AJ, believes that this Eric or Derek piece of her sister's case just kind of got passed around like a game of telephone. Maybe, you know, one person thought that they heard her say Eric or Derek, and then maybe whoever heard this told somebody who told somebody, and now they all truly believe that they're helping by saying that Eric or Derek was heard by them also when maybe it wasn't. Something else that I was thinking about myself is how different words would sound with your lungs full of smoke and soot and with your vocal cords being burned. And I've tried this at home to make different names or words sound like Eric or Derek with what I would think that you would sound like in this situation, and I came up with Sarah, Cedric, Erica, and even a few more random words that aren't names. Now, I'm not going to sound them out and reenact what I imagine that she sounded like, but if you're listening, try a few of those and see if that makes sense to you, because it sounded a pretty similar to me when I did it. One thing's certain, though. Whoever did this to Jessica had made it a point to cause her body to burn from the inside out. Jessica's funeral services were held at Wells Funeral Home Chapel on December 13th, 2014 at 2 p.m. So who was Jessica Chambers and why would someone do this to her? Jessica Lane Chambers was born on February 2nd, 1995 in Clarksdale, Mississippi. And she grew up in the tiny town of Cortland, Mississippi in Panola County. 
Now, Cortland is just on the outskirts of Batesville, Mississippi, which is just another small town that's close by that's popular among the people that live in Cortland. Maybe there are certain restaurants in Batesville that Cortland doesn't have or vice versa. And when I say this is a small town, I mean this is the smallest kind of small town vibe that you can envision. The entire town of Cortland had one gas station and a population of about 500 people, according to census records that I found for the like five years or so in between this happening. So this small town is right slap dab in the middle of the Bible Belt, where you're likely to find a church or two on every street corner. And everybody and their mama attend Sunday morning services. Where Friday night and Saturday night football is what people live for. And your team isn't just the team that you pull for to win. It's kind of your religion too. This is the kind of town where all the adults watch everybody else's kid grow up along with their own. And everybody literally knows everybody. And not just in a small town gossipy kind of way. In the kind of way where everybody in town just kind of feels like a part of your family. And this actually sounds a lot like where I live, and I promise it's not that bad out here in the sticks. Dennis Darby was the sheriff at the time of Jessica Chambers' murder, and he's actually quoted saying something that I thought was uh, pretty, pretty accurate. I hear so many negative comments about Mississippi. We're illiterate. We can't read and write. We don't even have running water down here, and we eat fried chicken every day. People don't like to hear the good. They want to hear the bad. We got a lot of good going around here too, but we do have really good fried chicken, end quote. And I just thought this was the funniest thing because I feel like this is actually how people perceive us because we live in the South. So I feel like this is probably a pretty accurate representation of what people think, and that's okay. Uh, Everyone that knew Jessica when she was young said that she was so generous, full of life, and extremely lovable. And not in the way that people often talk about people after they pass away. You could tell that people genuinely liked Jessica. Her parents were Ben and Lisa Chambers, and the couple would eventually separate and divorce when Jessica was about three years old. But the two remained close, and they co-parented like a boss. Even after this tragedy, Ben and Lisa still remain close, and Lisa is actually even close with Ben's new wife. So they all have a super healthy relationship, and Ben and Lisa would actually end up living right down the road from each other on the same street, less than an eighth of a mile apart after their divorce. And even though Jessica's dad, Ben Chambers, was present in her life, he also had what some might call a colorful past, and as Jessica got older, her relationship with her dad became more strained. In 2004, Jessica's dad, Ben, served a two-year stint in prison for possession of methamphetamine and the intent to manufacture methamphetamine, which would kind of come back to bite him later when his daughter was murdered because his colorful past wouldn't be the only thing to come back when Jessica was found murdered. There were also some interracial relationship issues that he had with his daughter Jessica, which we'll get further into later on. Jessica had been a cheerleader from a super early age, and the seven-part series that I watched doing some of my research on this case show Jessica at four and five years old in little cheerleading uniforms holding cheerleading pom-poms. She also played softball until she hit her teen years, but even as she got older, her love for cheer continued. Jessica was beautiful. She had the blondest kind of blonde hair and the biggest and bluest eyes you've ever seen. She was a teeny tiny teenager, which made her a perfect cheerleading flyer. And a cheerleading flyer, for anyone who doesn't know, is the one that you'd normally see being lifted and thrown by other people on the cheer team during their routines and dances. They're normally the ones that do the flips in the air, come back down to be caught by their team members. So her being so small, she was always a cheerleading flyer, and she was really good at it. Jessica had six siblings, three brothers, and three sisters. Some of them were step-siblings from her parents' previous or later relationships, A.J. Prince was one of Jessica's older sisters, and even though there was a six-year age difference between the two, Jessica liked to be wherever A.J. was when they were growing up, and A.J. said it was almost like she had her very own little shadow. As Jessica got older, her and her mom, Lisa, would grow to be almost like best friends. They were extremely close, and Jessica's mom says that they were close like best friends, but that they also fought and made up like best friends do as well. And the two were actually so close that during the Unspeakable Crime seven-part series on the murder of Jessica that I watched, her mom Lisa says, quote, I'll only be happy when I'm with her again, and I apologize to all of my other kids, but that's how I feel, end quote. So it seems like Jessica and her mom Lisa had a pretty special kind of bond. 
The kind of bond that you don't run into very often with a mother and daughter? Well, not with a teenage daughter anyways. Teenagers are awful little critters. But when Jessica was 17 in 2012, her parents said that she changed. And this change came after her 28-year-old brother, Alan, passed away from a fatal car accident. And her mom, Lisa, said that Jessica kind of lost herself after this and that she was never really the same. And this is when Jessica started trying different kinds of street drugs, And this was possibly a way for her to try to manage her grief. And I also feel like this is a pretty typical age for teenagers to start experimenting with different drugs. It's not as uncommon as we all like to believe. And maybe Jessica started experimenting with different drugs for different reasons than most teens. But this still doesn't seem very far-fetched from as far as what I know about teenagers. Jessica's mom, Lisa, said that after this car accident, when Jessica's brother, Alan, was taken from her that it seemed like Jessica kind of lost a piece of herself that day when Alan died too. Her friend group changed and school and cheerleading weren't Jessica's first priorities anymore like they had been before. When Jessica was a senior at South Panola High School, she started dating a boy by the name of Brian Rudd, and Jessica's mom, Lisa, said that, like most typical high school romances, Jessica and Brian were completely infatuated with one another. Her mom said that, Jessica was crazy over Brian and that she thought that Brian hung the moon, which is adorable. But when Lisa goes on to say that the two had what she would consider would be a pretty volatile relationship. Just for the record, because this will come up over and over again in this case, Jessica is white and Brian is black. Jessica actually ended up dropping out of high school in the 12th grade, if I'm not mistaken. And her dad, Ben, even tried taking away her car keys in hopes that it would keep her away from the crowd of people that she had started hanging out with. Like it never does, that didn't work, and Jessica ended up moving in with her high school boyfriend, Brian Rudd. The two lived together for about two years, and this was the start of what caused the pretty big divide between Jessica and her dad, Ben. And there were a few reasons for this divide in their relationship. Not only was Ben's teenage daughter living with a guy that she wasn't married to, who he had to assume she was having sex with, but also the fact that Ben wasn't the biggest fan of his white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed daughter dating someone of a different race. But I'm not going to go into that comment. I'm just going to leave that right where it is. And this race thing keeps coming up in this case, and there's really no way around it. Although it makes my stomach turn to think that we as a society haven't evolved more than this in 2022 years, we're going to keep moving on, though. Brian Rudd was also involved in a gang, which also means that he was also involved in gang-related activity. And even though Jessica was never involved in these gang activities or the gang itself, she was still an associate of Brian, who was a known gang member. And gangs usually equal drugs and violence, but it seems like Jessica's parents kind of knew that she smoked pot occasionally. But it wasn't long after before she got into more serious, dangerous, and harder drugs And some people even went so far as to claim that Jessica had been dabbling in crack cocaine and even crystal meth. But eventually, like most other high school relationships, Brian and Jessica eventually broke up and went their separate ways. Brian ended up moving to Iowa, and Jessica decided that she was ready to get her life together. And she entered an all-Christian female house aimed towards drug addiction, or at least that's what the rumors were. The facility where Jessica was staying claims to be a place where women go to get closer to God and to kind of figure out which direction they want to take their lives in. It doesn't say anything about being a drug rehab facility, but either way, she entered some sort of positive, life-changing affirmation program. Jessica left the program at the beginning of October 2014 and moved back in with her mother, Lisa. And things seemed to be looking up for Jessica. She had started talking about finishing high school, going into a nursing program, and she had even got a job at a local goodies department store. When Jessica got home and settled from the program that she was in for whatever reason she was in it, she started telling her parents that a man by the name of Roger Lynn Hintz had kind of been harassing her and even kind of threatened her about some money or something related to maybe past drug use. Robert Lynn Hintz was also a Cortland resident and even kind of known to the police as a local drug addict. And after Jessica's murder, her dad, Ben, was convinced for a while that this same man, Roger Lynn Hintz, was the one responsible for Jessica's murder. Her dad, Ben, says that Roger had threatened Jessica's life once before over an argument that they had over drugs, or maybe even the fact that he thought that Jessica had been telling people's drug business, their comings, goings, and things of that nature. But Roger was interviewed and later ruled out as a suspect in Jessica's case. 
And after Jessica got home from the program that she was in, she started dating a man by the name of Travis Sanford, who was also an African-American. And again, I'm only bringing the race thing up because it continually gets brought up in this case research. And even though people couldn't quite figure out why Jessica seemed to be so in love with Travis, she was definitely in puppy love with Travis. And I say that this was puppy love because Travis was quite a bit older than Jessica. There was a pretty substantial age difference between the two, which only seems relevant when you're talking about much younger people. I feel like the big age difference only gets creepy when you're talking about someone who's a super young age. But regardless of the age, Travis and Jessica were together. So now police have to try to retrace Jessica's steps and last movements on the day that she passed away and the days leading up to her death. And on December 6th, 2014, Jessica's mom, Lisa, says that Jessica left their house about 9.30 in the morning, that she was going to go run errands, she was going to meet up with a few people and hang out. She told her mom bye, and she left. When she left the house, Jessica picked up her good friend Keisha at around 10 a.m. Now, later when Keisha is testifying and when she's recounting the timeline from the day that Jessica was killed, Keisha says that Jessica picked her up at about 10 a.m., but that Quentin Tellus was also already in the car with Jessica. So sometime before Jessica picked Keisha up, she also must have picked up Quentin. Keisha says that the three of them rode around, they smoked some pot, and they grabbed a bite to eat. And from here, Jessica dropped Quentin off at his house, and afterwards, Jessica dropped Keisha off at her house. She told Keisha that she would talk to her later. And at around 2 p.m., Jessica came home and laid down in the recliner in the living room, and she took a nap. Jessica laid in the recliner sleeping until about 4 p.m. when her phone either rang from a call or notified her of a text message, which either way woke her up. So when Jessica gets woke up from her nap, she tells her mom that she'll be back later, and at about 5 p.m., Jessica left her house again. This time, she told her mom, Lisa, that she was going to go clean her car out, grab something to eat with some friends, and that she would be back later on that night. Jessica also told her mom that when she got home from wherever or whoever she had planned to go run these few errands with, that she wanted to get her room cleaned up. So, better than average teenage behavior in my very small expert experience with teenagers. My teenage niece is a pigsty. Her car, her room, everything's gross. It's just the way she is. We love her anyway. And at about 6.48, Jessica calls her mom, Lisa, and kind of just tells her, like, hey, I'll be home shortly, and that she would see her when she gets back home. Lisa tells Jessica that she loves her and that she'll see her later. Jessica's mom, Lisa, would have no way of knowing that this minute-long phone call would be the last time that she ever spoke to her daughter. Because at around 8 p.m., the fire department got the call about the car on fire, and this is when they would later find out that Jessica and her car were actually set on fire. Jessica would pass away just a few short hours later after this. After looking back on this last phone call that Lisa had with her daughter, she now believes that somebody had to have been in the car with Jessica when she called her mom to let her know that she'd be home shortly, because normally when Lisa spoke to Jessica... Especially when she was in her car, it was, you know, there was normally music playing in the background or Lisa could hear the wind from the windows being rolled down in Jessica's car. But this call was a little different. There was absolutely no background noise at all. And it was shortly after this last call that Lisa had with her daughter that Jessica's black 2005 Kia Rio would be found burning at such high temperatures that the black car would eventually look white from the char and flames burning the black paint off. This is when first responders found a burned-alive Jessica walking towards them, and not long after is when the Eric or Derek name came about. This scene was so brutal and so tragic that some of the volunteer firefighters and first responders that arrived on scene actually never returned to this line of work again after this scene. And I just feel like that's, that has to say something. They are trained for fires. They are trained for tragic and brutal. This was something that, I mean, some of them actually changed careers and never went back to firefighting or never went back to being a paramedic. I mean, that has to kind of show the gravity of the situation that they walked into. Volunteer firefighter Eddie Eadson still gets emotional and choked up when he tries to recall the events of the night. You can... It's, it's heartbreaking to watch a grown man cry. That's all I'll say. Ben Chambers, Jessica's dad, said that when the investigators told him how badly his daughter was burned, he said that he was told the only parts of Jessica that weren't burned were the bottoms of her feet. And as I've already gone over, Jessica would later pass away in the early morning hours of December 7th, 2014. 
Ben Chambers is quoted saying, quote, when the fire department got there, she was walking down the road on fire. The only part of her body that wasn't burned was the bottom of her feet. And as a parent myself, I absolutely cannot imagine somebody coming into my house and telling me that this happened to my child. Ben goes on to say, quote, They squirted lighter fluid down her throat and in her nose, and apparently they knocked her out. She had a big gash on the top of her head. And he then goes on to say that he would trade places with Jessica in a second if he was given the chance. The police also questioned every single person with the name Eric or Derek in their name, period. First name, middle name, last name. They questioned everybody with these two names, not only in the small town of Cortland, but also surrounding towns and counties. But even after questioning hundreds and hundreds of Eric's and Derek's and even Erica's, it never turned up anything that police were able to use. The assistant district attorney, Jay Hale, is quoted saying, quote, We're trying to go through the information we have, certainly interviewing all potential witnesses we can, and going through and using the phone records that we can. And the police in this case questioned hundreds and hundreds of people, and that doesn't really sound like that many people until you remember that this entire town only had about 500 people to start with. And I'm sure they were questioning people in other surrounding towns also. In order to see what Jessica did on the days and weeks leading up to her murder, police started pulling CCTV footage from anywhere in town that Jessica was known to frequent. So naturally, one of the first stops that they would make would be at the only gas station in Cortland, Mississippi, which is the M&M gas station, and sadly does not involve Slim Shady in any way. I know, we can cry later. But the cashier at the M&M gas station had heard about Jessica's death, and when he checked the security footage, he saw that it did show Jessica had been recorded on their security cameras just hours before her murder. He immediately turned the footage over to police, hoping that it would help in their investigation in some way. One of the first people that police looked into in the early days of the investigation was George Mister, who is commonly known as just Boone. And Boone was a friend of Jessica's who was interviewed during the Unspeakable Crime seven-part series, and Boone said that he was picked up at the M&M gas station and questioned. Boone was also caught on CCTV footage being at the M&M gas station around the same time and the same day that Jessica was there and the same day that she was eventually killed. But according to Boone, on that day that Jessica was killed, she had came to him and tried to trade Boone some crystal meth that she had for cocaine that she hoped that he had. Boone says that he and Jessica were friends, that sometimes she would stay over at his house, and that, yes, Jessica was a cheerleader, but she was fighting her own demons and that she was no saint, which none of us are, so that is not new news. And Boone had only been looked into this and questioned for a few different reasons. One, because he was at the gas station at the same time and day that Jessica was there on the day that she was killed, like I mentioned, and two, because he had a pretty extensive criminal background from his younger days, because he was also a good bit older than Jessica as well. But Boone had done his time for his crimes, and he was able to be cleared in Jessica's case. But since the first time that police stopped Boone at the local M&M gas station to question him, people have started flooding his social media accounts and the social media accounts of his family members, accusing him of being Jessica's murderer, even now, almost eight years later, people are still pointing the finger at him, even though he's been cleared. And in the first days of the investigation, police got what they thought were a few good, solid leads. Somebody called in a tip saying that someone in Iowa was threatening Jessica. Remember, her ex-boyfriend, Brian Rudd, had moved to Iowa. But when police sent somebody to interview this person, it turned out to have nothing to do with Jessica Chambers whatsoever. The next lead was somebody who lived in a completely different part of Mississippi who had confessed to murdering Jessica, but when police looked into it, the person who had allegedly confessed had a completely solid alibi, so that didn't pan out either. Jessica's older sister, A.J. Prince, got the call about Jessica, and she was told that Jessica had been burned, and at first she said that she kind of thought, like, oh, she burned her leg or her arm, and when somebody, you know, whoever called explained the extent of the injuries... AJ was a military wife. She was over 1,200 miles away when this call came in. So being so far away, AJ wanted to find something to do to help, even from that distance. So she created the Justice for Jessica Facebook page, and within the first 24 hours of this page being up, there were already well over 150,000 followers, 
But this wasn't the only Facebook page created for Jessica. In later months and years, there would also be a few different ones. One of those is the Jessica Chambers Mystery Facebook group. Five days after Jessica's death on December 12, 2014, the authorities offered up an $11,000 reward to the public for any leads or information in regards to Jessica's case. The reward just kept jumping higher and higher. It went from 11000 to 16000 to 30000 to 43000 to 54000 But it didn't seem to matter how much money was offered. Absolutely no leads were coming in in regards to Jessica. The store manager at the local M&M gas station spoke to police, and he also recalled that he found it kind of odd the day that Jessica came into the store on the day that she was murdered that she had gotten $14 worth of gas for her little Kia Rio car. And the only reason he thought this was odd was because Jessica would normally come in and put, you know, maybe $3 or $5 in her tank, which I feel like is pretty typical for most teens. They put as much gas as they need to get wherever they're planning on going and not a penny more. So the $14 that she put in her car would likely almost fill that car up with gas. This same store manager that just thought he was trying to help police with their investigation would actually end up having to move to another town. Just for the pure suspicion that the town of Cortland cast on him, I mean, he was almost harassed to the point of leaving town. And even though Jessica did live in such a small town, it was riddled with drugs and gang activity, and it seems like most everybody knew that you kind of keep your nose out of other people's business, You don't talk about what doesn't concern you, and you definitely don't speak to the police about other people's business. Jessica's mom, Lisa, was also quoted in an interview saying that just about everyone in town knows that snitches end up in ditches. And as cliche as that sounds, it is for the most part true, especially in areas where gang and drugs are pretty prevalent. The same day that Jessica passed away, because remember, she passed away in the early morning hours of December 7th. On this same day, there was a man who was pushing his child in a stroller down the road, and it wasn't far from where the car had been set on fire, maybe like an eighth of a mile, when he saw a set of keys on the side of the road in a ditch. And he had also heard about the fire, because like I said, this is a town of 500 people. I would assume everybody knew almost after it, you know, almost immediately after it happened. This man called police, and they came and picked the keys up from him. The police had to actually get fingerprints and DNA from this man, his girlfriend, and his child, because they all three touched the keys. And after they were able to rule those fingerprints and DNA out, they did more DNA testing and found a man by the name of Quentin Tellis. His fingerprints were found on the keys that were missing from Jessica's car when it was found burning. Now, this is the same Quentin Tellis that Jessica had been with with Keisha on the morning of her death. In order for investigators to see who Jessica had been in communication with in the days and weeks leading up to her murder, they had to get a few different phone warrants. The first kind of warrant that they got for their phone was they were only able to see who Jessica had called and texted and who had called and texted Jessica. The next warrant they were able to get was one where they would actually be able to read the text messages and see the duration of the calls made and the location they were made from. Now, this would also lead the police to Quentin Tellis. He was on Jessica's phone logs, calls, text, you know, you name it, he's there also. So, who is Quentin Tellis? Quentin was a friend of Jessica's, but the two had actually only known each other for a very short amount of time before Jessica was murdered. And the morning that Jessica was killed, Jessica and Quentin had hung out together with Keisha, like I mentioned. But he had claimed that he hadn't seen Jessica after that morning that they hung out. When she dropped him off at home, that was the last that he saw of her at about 11 a.m. And the police would actually end up interviewing Quentin five different times over the course of the next couple years. But only the last three interviews were recorded on video and audio. It doesn't help that Quentin has a pretty lengthy rap sheet of run-ins with the law and criminal convictions. Quentin had been charged with fleeing a police officer in 2006, larceny and burglary in 2009, possession of marijuana also in 2009, a DUI in 2010, and another burglary charge from 2011. But even with all those charges, none of those are really what you would consider violent crime charges. They're all drinking drugs and sticky fingers, taking things that don't belong to you. 
Quentin was released from his last stint in prison in October of 2014. That's the same year that he met Jessica and the same year that she was murdered. So he met Jessica in November and she was found burning alive in December of the same year. The two had actually met only about two weeks before her death. When Quentin was interviewed by police, he told them that he and Jessica had originally met at the M&M gas station in Cortland and that they had met through a mutual friend and that the two exchanged numbers. After they exchanged numbers, they immediately started hanging out, calling and texting all the time. But according to Quentin, the two weren't trying to start a quote-unquote boyfriend and girlfriend relationship. Possibly because he had a whole girlfriend already, but that's none of my business. Quentin also tells police during an interview that he was not with Jessica on the night that she was murdered. He doesn't deny that he was with her that morning, but like I said, he claims he hadn't seen her since about 11 a.m. on the morning before she passed away. When police finally got a hold of the text messages and phone records, it kind of backed up Quentin's story that the two had been in touch for the last few weeks. Quentin had even rode with Jessica on December 2nd, 2014 to pick up a prescription that she needed. And the next day on December 3rd, Quentin actually texted Jessica and basically propositioned her for sex. When Quentin texted Jessica's phone saying, quote, I'm horny, just days before her murder, Jessica simply replies with a text message just saying, oh lord. And I'm a female, so I can kind of tell you that, oh lord, is not quote for, yes, I cannot wait to screw your brains out. It actually means more along the lines of, I don't really want to sleep with you, but I'm trying to be a better person, so let me not be rude. There's another text message where Quentin tries to talk Jessica into coming to his house to have sex with him, but his mom and his sister, who he lives with, are at home. Jessica just kind of tells him that he's crazy and that there's no way in hell that she's going to have sex with him with his mom and sister in the same house in the next room. These wouldn't be the only times that Quentin would proposition Jessica to have sex with him because on December 4th, 2014, Quentin texted Jessica again saying something along the lines of, I'm horny. And again, Jessica responds in the same way with, oh lord. So he's persistent if nothing else. What the text actually said was, quote, I need you. And Jessica responds with, you know, what do you need? And Quentin says, some loving. So Jessica comes back again with her famous last words of, oh Lord, can't. And then on December 5th, 2014, which is the day before Jessica and her car were set ablaze, Jessica had texted Quentin asking to borrow $6 for something to eat. And again, Quentin's response to Jessica was, that if she would sleep with him, he would give her the few dollars that she was asking to borrow, which speaks volumes to me, but I'll let you come to your own conclusions. But it was only a few short minutes after this text was sent that you can see Jessica on the CCTV cameras meeting up with Quentin at the M&M gas station. You can see Quentin walk across the street to meet Jessica at the M&M gas station, and even though we aren't really sure what was said or what happened that day, you do see Quentin walk across the street to meet Jessica. Cell phone records and towers show that Jessica left the M&M gas station at 5.24 p.m. And from here, her phone tower pings show that Jessica left the M&M gas station and drove to Batesville, which is the next town over, the small town that I was talking about earlier that's right next to Cortland. And then she got to Batesville at about 6 p.m., though nobody really knows what Jessica was doing in Batesville. She couldn't have been in Batesville very long because her phone shows that she was back in Cortland by 6.30 p.m. So she left Cortland at about 5.30, drove to Batesville, got there at 6, and then drove back to Cortland and was back in Cortland by 6.30. And at about 7.30, Jessica's phone shows her leaving Cortland and her phone pinged in the exact spot where she and her car were set on fire. The last phone pings recorded were at 8.04 p.m. And at 8.04, it seems like the phone just completely shuts off. No cell tower pings, no GPS, no location data, nothing. Investigators kind of speculate that this is when the phone got so hot that it just completely shut off. Jessica's phone was found nearby after the fire was put out, and the last text that was sent to Jessica's phone before it completely stopped working was from Quentin Tellis. And this text message came in literal minutes before the 911 call about the car being on fire was placed. This text message was from Quentin, and it said something along the lines of, like, hey baby, can't hang out tonight, sorry, have a good night. And according to Quentin, at the time that Jessica's car would have been set on fire, he was in Batesville at a local dollar store buying a Green Dot card, which is a prepaid debit card. Quentin was actually getting this prepaid debit card for his girlfriend to send her money so that she would be able to come and visit because his girlfriend had been in a different state 
and he would end up later marrying this same girlfriend. And I just want to be Captain Obvious for a minute and point out the fact that Quentin has been blowing Jessica's phone up, basically begging her to have sex with him while he has a whole girlfriend. But we'll keep going. Even though Quentin had already told police that he hadn't seen Jessica since the morning when they rode around and smoked weed with Jessica and her friend Keisha, cell phone tower pings indicate that Jessica and Quentin's phones were both pinging from the local Taco Bell at the same time. This would kind of indicate that they were together at the local Taco Bell. Or at least they were at Taco Bell at the same time, even if they weren't initially planning to be there together. So these cell phone tower pings at the Taco Bell from both Quentin and Jessica's phone would kind of lead any logical person to believe that Jessica probably picked Quentin up on her way out of the M&M gas station parking lot and that they went to Taco Bell together. Now's probably a good time to mention that Quentin's house is directly across the street from the M&M gas station. He would walk there multiple times a day, and it seemed like most people in that town went to the gas station a few times a day, which I think that's just another small town thing because everybody I know does the same thing. This would also lead you to believe that if Jessica didn't pick Quentin up and if they didn't ride to Taco Bell together, that Quentin and Jessica would have at least seen each other and said hey or what have you, but they would have still seen each other if they were at Taco Bell at the same time. Even though Quentin keeps saying that he hadn't seen her since 11 a.m. when she dropped him off after their smoke session. So naturally, police go to Quentin and they say, hey, apparently you and Jessica were at Taco Bell at the same time for dinner on the day that she was killed. So maybe you want to rethink when the last time you saw her alive was? Then Quentin remembers, oh, we did eat dinner at Taco Bell. He claims that he had forgotten about their dinner at Taco Bell. And now he believes that this was actually the last time that he saw Jessica alive. I'm sorry, sir, how do you completely forget you had dinner with somebody? Just literal hours before something so graphic and awful happened to him. You don't. You just don't forget about that. So now Quentin's story is starting to piece by piece not add up to his own recollection of the timeline of events of that night. And on that note, since I am a trash human, I feel like the dinner at Taco Bell is a good stopping point for part one. Well, it's been fun. Let's do it again. Same time, same place, next Wednesday. See you then. That's how my mama murdered a podcast.